Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Educational Assessment with Professor Denovoli. I am your host, Professor Denovoli, and this is episode seven, Creating Essential Questions. It's It's been really cold lately, and this is like my seventh take. Uh, th things have been, been slow with the computer, but here we go. Uh, the agenda for, uh, for this module, um, what are the elements of essential questions? What are the uh, what is the what are the purposes of essential questions uh, within UBD uh, or backwards design? What are some examples and non-examples of essential questions? And how do you write an essential question? So some elements of essential questions. Uh, they are written as open-ended questions. So there are no single correct answer to the uh, to them. There are not yes or no questions. Uh, they usually require critical thinking skills, um, and they're not they're not just a single answer. They are intellectually engaging. They invite you as well as the students into the process of learning. Uh, they require higher order thinking skills. Think the hess rigor matrix when we speak of that. Um, the ideas in essential questions are important and transferable. They often raise additional questions. So oftentimes um, an essential question is usually a lead question to another question. Uh, they require student justification in responding to the essential question. And they recur over time, meaning that these essential questions will spiral throughout a unit uh, as well as a course of study. So a course of study may have a handful of essential questions that will spiral throughout the different units. So quick game show, is it essential? So here we go. Is it essential? So question one. In what year was the Battle of the Bulge fought? Is that essential? And the correct answer is no. It is not essential because there is only one single answer. A better essential question would be something to the effect of um, what were some lessons learned in the Battle of the Bulge? Um, how was the Battle of the Bulge a turning point in the war um, that is more open-ended and there's not one single answer to it? Uh, next one. How do effective writers hook and hold their readers? How do effective writers hook and hold their readers? Is it essential? Yes, that requires a complex answer to it. Uh, and there's not one singular answer to it. And in many cases, it's actually an opinion because two writers may think differently on how to hook and hold their reader's attention. Question three, is biology destiny? Is biology destiny? Yes, it is open-ended. Uh, there, there's, uh, even though it is a yes or no question, the explanation of it, uh, makes it open-ended. So, uh, you usually can't stop with is, is biology destiny? Yes, no. Um, the reason why this is considered an essential question is because it, it prompts more questions. What do we mean by destiny? How do you define destiny? How is biology destiny? How is it not destiny? So that's why it's a uh, it's a an essential question. Question number four. Automatopoeia. What's up with that? Automatopoeia. What's up with that? Is it essential? No, because it's a definition question. There's only one answer to that. Uh, the next one, five. What are examples of animals adapting to their environment? What are examples of animals adapting to their environment? And the answer is no here because that's a specific question. Uh, this is asking about uh, species adaptation in an environment. So the, this is a specific answers. 
What are the limits of arithmetic? Is it essential? What are the limits of arithmetic? And the answer to this is yes. It's an abstract question, and it gives insight into math, even though I don't like math. But that's a different story. So here we go. Let's continue on with our journey. The purpose of essential questions in UBD or backwards design. So as we have said in previous modules, when we unpack the standards, we develop our learning targets. And these learning targets fit within the essential questions. Uh, we use the essential questions to frame the learning targets. Uh, they transfer uh, the learning across subjects and outside of school. Like that's the purpose of the essential question. It, it allows the students by asking certain essential questions is how, how are what we going to learn in this unit of study or in this course, how is that going to transfer uh, across subjects as well as outside of school? And for the teacher, it helps the teacher interrogate the subject matter. Um, and really frames the rest of uh, a, a lesson, a course of study, a unit, uh, because the students are, are going to learn the answers. That, that would be the whole point of, of those essential questions, that they guide the teacher into framing what the students are going to learn. What are questions that lead to those answers? Um, and we organize our essential questions with our learning targets. Um, and what's important about essential questions are the intent of the, the questions over the form. So they require higher order thinking. Um, higher order thinking does not always follow form. So who is a winner? Um, I mean, depending on the unit of study, this could work, this could not work. Who is a winner kind of sounds like a, um, a definition question. However, based off of context, who is a winner could actually be the whole point of the unit of study. What do we define as who are winners and lo losers in history? Um who are winners and losers in games like we could we could take that to the next level like in sports let's say uh who is a winner and who's a loser in sports we could think literally a winner and a loser is based off of points that could be the literal definition but we could also argue that the winner is the individual who um has sportsmanship qualities uh, and learns from the games whether or not their team wins or loses. So it it it, it can work depending on context as well. Essential questions are recursive over time pondering, meaning that, as we said before, that um, they spiral throughout, throughout uh, the course of study. Uh, and we also have to consider the developmental level of our students when writing our essential questions. Uh, here's a quote from McTie and Wiggins. The essentialness of the question depends upon why we pose it, how we intend students to tackle it, and what we expect for the associated learning activities and assessments. Again, essential questions frame our course of study, whether it's within a daily lesson, whether it is a unit of study, or it's in a course of study. Some examples, what goes on in the head of a baby? What goes on in the head of a baby? Uh, why does music evoke emotions? What do collapses of past societies teach us about our own future? How does art shape culture? How do I know what I can believe about a scientific claim? As you can see, if, if these were shared with students at the beginning of a course of study. And then you say, okay, we're going to explore these questions in this unit. Uh, one of the things we're going to talk about later in this particular um, lecture 
is you could then use these questions in the assessment at the end because arguably your students should be able to answer these questions at the end of the course of study. So some examples and non-examples of essential questions. So let's start with the examples. What do effective problem solvers do when they get stuck? Okay, today's, today's uh, lesson, we're going to uh, explore this question of what do effective problem solvers do when they get stuck? Okay, today's lesson, we're going to explore, is there ever a just war? Is there ever a just war? Um, who is a true friend? What should we eat? I like that one. I kind of, I really like that one, I, but I kind of want more to that. Like, what should we eat to be healthy? What should we eat? You know, like, uh, uh, as human beings, what should we eat? Should we eat meat? Should we eat only? Should we be vegan? I mean, I, I think that would be a, I, I want to add on to that particular one because I think that that one has a lot more potential than than there actually is. But here are some non-examples. What steps do I follow to get an answer? I mean, um, not only is that not essential, it's irrelevant. <laughs> Quite honestly, it's it's e irrelevant. What key event sparked World War One? Okay, in a history lesson, we may ask this question. This may be on the test, what key events sparked World War I. But as far as an essential question, this does not require high-level thinking skills. Who is Sandy Cheek's best friend? SpongeBob or Patrick? <laughs> I mean, it, it, there's there's not many correct, uh, correct answers to, to choose from for that one. How much dairy should I drink daily? Uh... I don't know. And the point of this one, this last one, we tend to think that how and why questions make essential questions. But again, it's about intent. How much dairy should I drink daily? That's a, you know, a measurement. That's that's a it's a very um, uh, short response as opposed to an open ended response. A uh, quick review, remember that essential questions are open-ended. They're not single correct answers. Uh, they're thought-provoking and intellectually engaging. They recur, can and should be revisited throughout a, a lesson, a unit of study, and a course of study. They're uh, generative. They spark inquiry and raise other questions. And students should be able to answer them by the end of the unit. Uh, they can be on the summative assessment. I mean, a, a really good, really well-constructed essential questions could then be on the assessment because if you as the teacher explored these questions in the unit, students should be able to, to intellectually engage with these questions on the assessment at the end. Uh, so let's let's talk about how to how to write the essential question. So first, we're going to unpack our standards, focusing on the nouns and the adjectives. We've we've done this already. So here's one from uh, this is a seventh grade one. Trace and evaluate the argument and specific claims in a text, assessing whether the reasoning is sound and the evidence is relevant and sufficient to support the claims. So from this standard. We're going to go to what we call the big understanding. What's the big takeaway? What's the big idea? That's what the big understanding is. What's the big idea? And the big idea for this particular standard is an argument is supported by claims that are organized by clear reasoning, logic, and further supported by evidence that needs to be relevant and sufficient to support claims. So that's the big idea. And the big idea is like if I wanted to guide my students toward the answer of the essential question. Now, again, the point is this. The essential question is open-ended. But if we are standards-based, the students should be able to, you should be able to guide them toward that answer through how you teach the unit. So for example, how do we argue to win? 
What does it mean to be a good lawyer? What makes a good but ethical salesperson? Well, these are individuals who use argument that are supported by claims and organized by clear reasoning or logic. And so the point is this. The essential question matters as the the launch pad to to get to the standard. But again, because we do backwards design, we start with the standard, we start with the end, and we work backwards. What's the big idea? What's the what's the answer that we hope our students are going to come to by the end of this course of study? And then you know what? Now, how do I ask the question in such a way that I hope that when I teach them the material, they'll be able to answer with the big idea or the big understanding? Oh, uh, <laughs> the Teletubbies. Again! Again, all right. So we're going to use a um, a math uh, standard this time. This is a kindergarten. Is this a kindergarten standard? Solve addition and subtraction problems to find unknown angles on a diagram in real world with mathematical problems. I think this is fourth grade because uh, I don't even know if I would have been able to have done that in kindergarten. But anyway. What's the big idea from, from this particular uh, question? Angles of 90, 180, and 360 can be broken down. And if there is an angle of a shape we do not know, we can add or subtract to find that angle. All right. So some essential questions we can ask. How do quilters figure out how to fit strange shapes together? Well, they figure it out by the angles adding and subtracting material. Okay, so so that's the point here of how we could use the essential questions to, to guide the instruction. Why are there 360 degrees in a circle? What do degree measurements help us do? All right. Summary. Essential questions are open-ended, thought-provoking, intellectually engaging, Revisit it throughout a unit of study and ex and also extend inquiry. By the end of a unit of study, students should be able to answer them. Therefore, essential questions can be part of the summative assessment. Essential questions transfer learning across the subject matter. The purpose of the question matters more than the format of it. Be mindful of what you essentially want students to come away with. To write an essential question, unpack your standard, determine the big understanding or the big idea, and write a question or two that will essentially lead students to explore the big understanding. And because essential questions are the questions that students should be able to answer at the end of a unit of study, this is another example as to how assessment drives instruction. Thank you, everyone. That was episode seven. We're flying through the course. We're already seven weeks in. Uh, and that's it for now. I'll uh, I'll see you on GroupMe. Talk to you soon.